Welcome to another EduMed video, and this is the next in the series of videos reviewing the weekly ICNARC or ICU audit data for the UK. And this is based on the audit data that was released on the 10th of April, which looked at all admissions from the 4th of April through to the 9th of April, and it's cumulative. Now, there's a few things that we'll be concentrating on, but basically it's going to follow the same pattern as the previous video and as such show the update and how things are going as we're gaining more data and therefore more of an insight into both the disease process and also the underlying themes within the disease itself. I think the first thing to say is that we've just got more numbers and it's quite staggering how much things are starting to increase. Again, we've got good participation with the majority of units um, giving us data. Surprisingly, there's still a number of um, units which have not seen COVID yet. And that tends to indicate that we're still probably early on in this disease process. But partly also because we're just still at the moment of cohorting some patients from areas that have small units through to areas that have a large capacity. And certainly in London, there's um, some movement of patients to bigger units, which A, are able to manage more of these patients and also have a bit more experience with managing these patients now. Either way, we've got about 4,690 patients that have been admitted so far into critical care with COVID. Compare that to 2,600, and you can see how staggeringly the numbers are increasing in just a very short period of time. And that's the real key with COVID. It's just creating such a large number of um, patients being influxed into critical care, and it's just really keeping the capacity able to cope with the just large influx. We have data now for an increasing number of patients. I have to emphasize that this is still a small number of patients and we're still early on in the disease process. So all of the um, inferences that we're making on this data so far is preliminary. You can see the staggering rate at which the deaths have increased more than doubled in just a week. And we're now sitting at about 871 in the UK. And that's just talking about critical care. We're not talking about the patients who aren't even making it to critical care, either because of comorbidities or because they just haven't had the chance to get there because they've deteriorated so quickly. There's still a staggering number of patients that are still staying in critical care. And as we will go through later in this talk, this data that's starting to come out is that these patients are staying in critical care for a fair amount of time. So undoubtedly this number is going to keep going up as more new cases come in. This is again the graph just to show the distribution of patients that are um, COVID positive throughout the country and you can see that still London by far has the most number of patients but the others are starting to catch up. Now obviously we'll never get to the same number as London because the population density in London is so much greater than the rest of the UK and that has implications not just on the spread of the disease and how quickly it will pass from person to person but also the total number of people living in a certain area. So you can see that um, Wales seems not to have that many cases yet and certainly other areas of London, the north, sorry, of um, England, especially in the north, they're starting to see some, but they're still nowhere near that of London yet. And I suspect these numbers are just going to continue to rise, and it'll rise almost exponentially once they get a few cases of critical care COVID disease, they'll start getting more and more. And that's certainly what we saw in early London data. In terms of the demographics, they really haven't changed from last week. We're still seeing that the average age for COVID is around 60, which is similar to that of the non-COVID viral pneumonias of yesteryear. Still, there's a big predominance towards males getting critically ill with COVID, more so than women, almost um, three quarters more likely. Sorry, twice as likely. So three quarters as likely.
compare that to the um, viral pneumonias where actually they're both pretty equally spread between men and women. So this does seem to be a disease of men when it comes to critically unwell with COVID. And I emphasise critically unwell because remember the data that we're looking at here is just patients who are coming to intensive care. We aren't looking at all patients with COVID. And to be honest, we wouldn't really have that data because testing is just not widespread enough yet. It doesn't seem to have um, much of a predilection for pregnancy at the moment. But again, we're talking about very small numbers, just a thousand patients that are women so far. So really, we need more data before we can give you a good answer as to exactly what the um, predilection and the dangers in pregnancy are. The really interesting data here is the ethnicity. Now, if you remember from the last video, we talked about the fact that the distribution seemed relatively equal amongst the um, other ethnicities given their um, relative number in the population. But now we're starting to see that the numbers in Asians and black patients especially seem to be going up proportionately higher. And if you compare that to the non-COVID viral pneumonias, you can see there's a lot more. The honest answer is you don't know why. Now, it might be that there's just two smaller numbers and we're just seeing what's a statistical variation, essentially. However, it does beg the question about why these people are a slightly higher predilection of developing severe disease. Now, could it be that everyone is getting infected at exactly the same rates, but um, ethnic minorities tend to have a lower socioeconomic status and therefore they may be waiting longer before coming into hospital or it might be due to viral exposure. T they tend to live in um, more closed quartered areas such as um, flats and estates. They may well be working in uh, public facing jobs such as for example the healthcare sector with doctors and nurses being a large number of ethnic minorities proportionately to the population. Also, other jobs such as bus drivers, working in supermarkets and so on. The honest answer is you really don't know, but it is an interesting um, observation, whether it's more a reflection of socioeconomics or whether it's a reflection of the disease having a predilection for these ethnic minorities is genuinely up for debate and we probably won't have an answer for a while but interesting to note nonetheless. And then in terms of BMI, um, we are starting to see a little signal that, again, right at the start, we were starting to see a lot of patients with slightly higher BMIs developing quite severe disease. And then it sort of leveled out a little bit, but you can see here that actually we're starting to get more of the higher BMIs as a percentage being um, represented compared to, for example, in the um, non-COVID viral infections in the past. And really those patients with very low BMIs are not presenting in any great number. Now, I have to emphasize we're looking at small numbers still. And so these anecdotal um, observations and this early data, although may suggest that higher BMI gives a higher predilection towards severe disease, the honest answer is, again, we don't know. But it's interesting to note that trend. If we look at the dis age distribution, we are seeing that a lot of different ages are affected. But as always, as we've been saying right from the start, those patients who are older tend to have more um, severe disease, i.e. coming to intensive care. And um, the fact that it's dropping off as you get to the older age groups may be more a reflection of selection bias and the fact that we're not admitting those patients with multiple comorbidities or um, high frailty score into intensive care. So we're probably not seeing a lot of these patients uh, even in this data, because this data is purely looking at intensive care admissions, nothing else. The question of whether the ethnicity um, seems to be a predilection to COVID is difficult, and this graph and the ICNAC data do try to tease out whether it's a matter of distribution in terms of 
um, population. And you can see here in orange is the population match from the 2011 uh, census. Now, one reason that we might be seeing slightly more um, ethnic minorities with the disease is because of where the disease seems to be most, most prevalent at the moment, which is in London. And in London, we generally tend to have more, pa more people of ethnic uh, minority background than in the rest of the country. So as the disease spreads to the rest of the country, we might see that it all equals out a little bit more. But it doesn't seem to be outside the realms of possibility. Now, obviously, I haven't done any statistical analyses on this, but certainly just visually, they seemed not to be too uh, different from each other. The um, black, the darker blue line being that of viral pneumonias, which does seem to be less affecting people of ethnic minorities. But certainly COVID does seem to be following the pattern of the consensus, the census data, which you can see in the orange and the bars being the COVID data. Now, as I said, the BMI does seem to be um, showing that these patients are getting more critical illness. You can see, again, the um, dark blue line here. This is the patients with non-COVID disease. You can see a shift over towards more higher BMIs for the COVID. And it does, uh, so at least compared to that of viral pneumonia, it does seem to affect the higher BMIs, 25 and above, more so. However, if you then um, have a look at your um, orange line here, which is the census data uh, for the general population, you can see that it is following that fairly equally, the bars again being the COVID disease. So it might just be that it's affecting everyone and we're just seeing it more and it just so happens that in non-COVID viral infections it just doesn't seem to affect people of higher BMI as much. And again, we're looking at small numbers still and so as time goes on hopefully we'll get a bit more data. Now the thing that I really want to emphasise here is just how good these COVID patients are pre-morbidly. So in fact when you're comparing patients with COVID to those with non-COVID viral pneumonias, 93% of people are, have good functional status compared to 73% in the viral pneumonia uh, that's non-COVID. So it, automatically what we're doing is we're comparing a group of um, patients here with COVID whose functional baseline was better than that of the viral pneumonia. So when we're looking at the outcomes, we've also got to bear in mind the fact that the physiological state of the patient may well have been worse in the non-COVID viral pneumonia patient compared to those of COVID. And this is the thing that I find really quite disconcerting with COVID, is the fact that it seems to be knocking out people who are otherwise fit and healthy with good physiological reserve. And you can see this here with only very few people requiring um, any assistance with their daily activities. And similarly, comorbidities, you can see here, see here a couple of percent at most. The other interesting thing that's um, put here is whether patients required CPR, whether they had cardiac arrests in or out of hospital. You can see fairly similar numbers already. So this does seem to be a severe disease and um, we are starting to see more people in the community and in hospital with um, CPR. I'm sure as the numbers um, become greater with the number of people being infected and with disease, we're going to see that rise. Now, this is just a visual um, representation of the stay in critical care. And this is to summarise the fact that there are just so many more people dying. But in terms of looking at those who are dying versus those who are discharged alive, as all patients who come to intensive care, it does seem to be roughly equal 50-50.
So it's worth us having that in mind and speaking to our um, patients who are being admitted into intensive care that the overall mortality from this if you come to intensive care is about 50-50. And I think that's useful for uh, expectation setting. It's useful for the family as well because it just gives them a better idea of what to expect. But you'll see actually if we tease out the numbers a little bit more, those patients who are getting um, intubated within the first 24 hours seem to do a lot worse than those that don't. And that's probably a reflection of both the rapidity of the um, disease progression, but also how late these patients are presenting to intensive care. And again, it's very difficult for us to tease out the difference at this point. The other thing that I want to really highlight is the staggering number of people who are still in critical care. And bearing in mind, if you look at this, these graphs, we are still on the upward trend. So this number will likely increase and probably increase at a faster rate than these two numbers, which is the number of people coming out of intensive care. So the key point that I want to make here is the fact that our intensive care bed need is going to go up and it won't be plateauing for a long time yet because there will be a lag for the, all those patients who have made it to intensive care who then have to go through intensive care treatment, convalescence and to be discharged. Now, again, just to highlight, we're talking about 50-50, whether people who come into intensive care die or survive. You compare that to the much more favourable, almost 80% of people who are surviving with a non-COVID viral pneumonia coming to intensive care previously. And if you look at the amount of time that patients are staying in uh, intensive care, it is still a fair amount of time. Now, granted... The um, it does seem to be slightly lower than that with viral pneumonia, but if you look at non survivors, it's about the same. Now, uh, it should be noted that the interquartile ranges are slightly higher for the viral pneumonias, but we're still very early days here with COVID, and so I suspect we'll start to get a better idea of the range as we get more patients as time goes on because we just haven't literally had enough time to get a good handle on the time course for this disease. Now, the other staggering thing is just the number of people who are requiring advanced respiratory support. This is patients that are being intubated, ventilated for respiratory failure. You can see that there's 67% of people compared to less than 50% in the non-COVID non viral pneumonias. There was an initial suggestion that actually these patients didn't really need multi-organ support and they just presented as pure respiratory failure. But we are starting to see that these patients are needing either basic or advanced cardiovascular support, um, probably in the same amount as the viral pneumonias. Again, the numbers are small still. But we're also seeing quite a significant number of patients requiring renal support. It's worth um, having a look at the pre my previous videos where we talked about the UK experience with COVID, or the early experience at least. And there's a suggestion that maybe the treatments that we were doing both before coming to intensive care and during intensive care may have been unduly injurious to kidneys, especially the high PEEP strategies and running them much drier without a good appreciation of the underlying pathophysiology, especially in the L phenotype of the disease. But the key point here is these, do, these are starting to look more like um, our normal intensive care patients who develop a degree of multi-organ failure. So as much as I wish that they remain as just purely respiratory failure, a lot of them are complex multi-organ failure patients, especially by the end of their stay in intensive care. I think it's quite interesting just to look at the number of days on organ support, because really this is going to give us an indication of the utility and the demand that's going to be put on critical care services. You can see here that patients on average are needing seven days of advanced ventilatory support, i.e. being intubated and ventilated. 
and and that's just uh, the median with a range of between four days and ten days. And similarly, they're needing a few days, three days uh, as a median for needing advanced cardiovascular support and six with basic. And I'll go through that in the next slide as to what that means. And interestingly, four days on renal support. Now, these are all much lower than the amount of time with the non-COVID viral pneumonias. However, this isn't a, um, a small amount of time. So even when we hit the peak number of patients who are admitted to intensive care, we have to remember that there's going to be a cumulative accumulation of these patients because there's a lag of at least seven to ten days um, before they can be stepped down off intensive care and often longer. Again, we're in early days. We've only got data now for a few weeks. So as time goes on, we'll get a much better handle of what the time course is. But certainly, anecdotally and from this data, we're seeing that it's taking weeks for these patients to come off intensive care. Now, just worth talking a little bit about what we were talk what we mean by advanced versus basic respiratory support. So advanced respiratory support is essentially invasive ventilation where we're intubating or we're putting the patients on ECMO. But what's really important to emphasize is the fact that in ICNOC, we class um, CPAP and BiPAP via a mask as a period of basic respiratory support. And just you're probably starting to see a lot from the Italian data and we in the UK are starting to do more of both high flow oxygen and CPAP can be good holding measures and given the pathophysiology of what's happening to these patients in the old phenotype, intubation may not confer much additional benefit compared to spontaneous ventilation. Now I say that with a huge proviso because there's much more complex um, things here than just the disease pathophysiology and treating that. Thinking about intrapleural pressures, air hunger, tiring of patients, um, progression of patients from a, in a biphasic manner from the L to the H phenotype. All of these things count, but just on the very face of it, from the data, it's worth taking with a pinch of salt that some of these patients with so-called basic respiratory support are actually receiving NIV or high flow oxygen, which arguably I would consider, especially in this disease process, to be an advanced ventilatory support method. Similarly, basic cardiovascular support could be a single vasoactive um, drug. So even though it seems basic, this is still a, at least level two patient. So these patients are sick. As you could see from the values in the tables, the data suggests that although not many patients are needing renal replacement therapy, you can see almost 20% are needing it. So it's not the small number that we were expecting when we first saw the data coming out of China suggesting just very simple single organ disease early in the um, pandemic. I think this is probably the most useful graph and it's very similar to the previous um, ICNAC report but it's worth re-emphasizing with the slightly more updated data. You can see here this is all patients. And what this is showing is roughly 50% of patients are dying, 50% of patients are surviving. And that's useful general information. But I think what's far more useful is actually teasing out who is dying. And the first thing I want to draw your attention to is this green line. You can see here the green line. These are patients not receiving mechanical ventilation within the first 24 hours. You can see here that almost 70% of these patients are surviving. Only 30% are dying if they don't receive mechanical ventilation in the first 24 hours. You compare that now to those patients who are receiving mechanical ventilation in the first 24 hours. This line here. See how many more patients are dying. That almost 65 plus a percent of these patients are dying if they receive mechanical ventilation in the first 24 hours. So at least in terms of discussing things with the patient, the family, and also in your own mind, 
it's worth considering the fact that if patients are being admitted, we're talking about a two-thirds chance that these patients will die in intensive care or shortly thereafter. So those are the really sick patients. And although that seems quite intuitive, it's also quite reassuring to know that if you can get patients through the first 24 hours on intensive care without intubating them, they are likely to do quite well. Now, this is the numbers just showing this, and you can see here the staggering difference between those patients who are receiving advanced respiratory support versus those receiving basic respiratory support. And I emphasize basic includes NIV with CPAP or BiPAP. Almost 80% of patients are surviving if they've got um, just basic support. And this is throughout their intensive care stay. Those patients who are requiring intubation and ventilation at any point, um, but especially those with um, in the first 24 hours, they seem to do quite badly. The length of stay for those patients who are being intubated and ventilated um, in the first 24 hours is actually slightly longer at eight days, and it's taking six days before these patients are dying. So again, this is a long protracted course. And in terms of other organ support, you're seeing that they are requiring um, some other support. Um, unsurprisingly, they need a bit of basic cardiovascular support. Potentially, that's due to patients requiring some inotropic or vasopressor therapy to offset their um, sed sedative effects that they've been required when they've been intubated and ventilated. So I wouldn't read too much into this. But advanced support, cardiovascular support is fairly high and that's probably a reflection of the fact that they're developing multi-organ failure and are just that much more unwell compared to those patients receiving basic respiratory support. And again, I want to highlight the fact that the, it is taking a week plus for these patients to come off the intensive care. They're requiring this ventilate, this advanced support for a week or more. So this is not going to be a slow, um, this is not going to be a quick thing to resolve our massive intensive care needs. It's only going to get more so than less. It's worth also looking at the um, number of the, the age distribution of those who are being discharged from critical care. And you can see here that as patients get older, they are becoming less likely to be discharged alive from critical care, and that the vast majority of patients over the age of 80 are dying. 70% of them are dying. And I think, again, it's worth having that in mind. Obviously, it very much depends upon the patient and how frail they were, what their physiological reserve was, and what comorbid disease they have. But in general, they do seem to be at higher risk of dying. Once patients come to intensive care, the interesting thing is they do seem to be relatively equal in the number of, um, in the percentage chance that they will die based on sex. And that's interesting because it seems like men tend to develop more severe disease but those women who develop severe disease are just as likely to die as men are. The BMI, as I said, it's an interesting thing. And we are seeing that maybe compared to the non-COVIDs, we're getting more of the higher BMIs. But what's interesting is the fact that whether you've got, or if you've got a high BMI, actually the chance of surviving and dying it's roughly 50-50. Again, small numbers, but it's suggesting that actually having the higher BMIs doesn't increase your mortality necessarily. But again, take that with a pinch of salt. We need more data. So I think it's worth taking a few things away from this. And uh, as always, I find the ICNARP data really interesting. We're still in early days, and I know, and I think I'll probably keep saying that, 
for the next few months because I think until we've got a good set of long-term data for these patients, it's difficult to draw any significant conclusions. We're still mainly located around London and the southeast of England, but the rest of the, of the UK is starting to catch up. The average age is about 60 and that reflects what we're seeing elsewhere in the world as well. Men are more likely to have severe disease and have the need to come to critical care. I think that statement still stands to be true. Um, now, we, if we assume that everyone is at equal risk of initially contracting or being exposed to the disease, then the fact that we're seeing more men coming into critical care tends to indicate more of them are developing significant symptomatic disease compared to women. But once women are coming in, they're at equal risk of um, dying compared to women. The key thing that's really starting to change is that we're starting to see this signal towards ethnic minorities having more disease and more severe disease. Now, that might just be a reflection, as I said, of socioeconomics or exposure to viral load, given the types of jobs that ethnic minorities seem to predominate in. What's really scary as an intensivist is the majority of the patients who are being admitted to intensive care have good pre-morbid function and as such these are good physiological substrates who are then deteriorating and dying so that 50% mortality rate is just that much more disconcerting. There still is a signal to suggest that these patients are requiring intubation slightly earlier than the classical viral pneumonia. Again, whether that's our mindset of tubing these patients early as opposed to watching and waiting, or the fact that we've been limiting the amount of high flow oxygen and um, non-invasive ventilation, especially on wards, given the risk of aer aerosolization of the virus, I don't know. And certainly in the international uh, literature, there seems to be a trend towards people suggesting uh, trying non-invasive ventilation first with um, CPAP hoods, with high flow and so on. And looking at the ELT phenotype at least, the, physio the pathophysiology of it does seem to suggest that VQ matching is more important than actually positive pressure ventilation with high PEEP and um, recruitment type manoeuvres which is what invasive ventilation is really good at. The other scary thing is that still about twice as many people are dying as uh, with uh, non-COVID viral infections. The numbers are starting to merge a little bit more, but in general this does seem to be a lethal disease. Many more people are needing to be intubated and requiring advanced ventilatory support compared to that of the non-COVID viral infections. And interestingly, these patients are requiring organ support. The early indications that they were just going to be single organ failures is not so much holding true. And um, in fact, last week it seemed the same as the flu. Statistically, I don't know whether it's any different, but there does seem at least eyeballing that there's maybe even a slightly higher risk of these patients requiring multi-organ support. There's also a signal that these patients are starting to take longer on intensive care than the non-COVID viral pneumonias. And certainly having looked after these patients, I'd suggest that that's probably true. And finally, once in ITU, both men and women seem to have the same risk of death. So overall, we're starting to learn a lot more about this disease. It's difficult because I think the more time we have, the more follow-up we have, the better we'll start to understand the pathophysiology and the time course for this disease. But certainly, I think this is a significant disease. This is a disease that's going to continue on for long after we hit the so-called peak number of cases given the duration of time these patients are requiring advanced support, be that ventilatory, cardiovascular or otherwise. And it's going to have an incredible demand on our resources. And as such, we need to be careful about what we do. Also, a good understanding of the um, outcomes and really starting to think about why some of these demographics, the older patients, the patients with ethnic minorities, why they're slightly 
uh, increased risk, at least in the data, of having significant disease and dying. I hope you found this useful. I'll continue to review the ICNOC data as it comes out every week and update what it was compared to the last week. And if you've got any suggestions or you've got any comments about um, any of this, then please uh, put a comment in the comment section below. And also, if you can, um, there's the actual link to the uh, report in the description. Have a click, have a read through of yourself. I've highlighted the important things, but there's a lot more information there that's really interesting. Thank you very much.